Good morning, church. Let's try that again. Good morning, church. Good morning. Oh, that's wonderful. Hey, why don't you stand with me really quick? Let's um, let's begin worship in just a, a moment of prayer. Psalm 150, verse 6 says, Let everything that has breath praise the Lord. I want you to take just a moment on your own and just give praise to the Lord for who He is, for what He's done in your life, and then we'll come back together and pray corporately. Just take a moment. Lord, your word says in Psalm 150, verse 6, let everything that has breath praise the Lord. Lord, we thank you for the breath that is in our lungs today. God, thank you that we were able to wake up this morning, to get out of bed, to come here today to, to worship you in song, in the study of your word, in giving back to you. Lord, thank you for this day that you've created. Your word says in Psalm 118, 24, that this is the day that the Lord has made. Let us rejoice and be glad in it. Lord, we rejoice because we know that you are a faithful and a loving God who has done so much for us. So thank you, Lord, for what you have done in our lives. And we pray these things in your name. Amen. Stay standing. Let's continue. In a spirit of worship, Psalm 95, verse 1 says, Come, let us shout joyfully to the Lord. Shout triumphantly to the rock of our salvation. Let us enter his presence with thanksgiving. Let us shout triumphantly to him in song. For the Lord is a great God, a great King above all gods. Let's sing this together.
Have a seat if you would, please. Good morning, everyone. We are so glad that you were able to join us this morning. If you're a guest, we would love to get to know you and how we could be praying for you. If you could do so, please fill out the Connect card in the pew in front of you and turn it into guest services, or you can drop them in the offering box. We also have this QR code if you would rather scan that. Just a reminder, if you're on the personnel committee, you guys are meeting at 1.30 today. And deacons, you will be meeting at three o'clock. We are currently searching for a new children's minister. We ask that you please pray that the Lord will guide us to the right person to lead our kids. Thank y'all for joining us this morning. Now let's watch this video.
Let's stand together. Lift our song together today with the song of worship that's already happening around the throne of God.
Join our song today with a song of worship that is happening around the throne room today. All your works shall praise your name in earth, in sky, and sea, as that song we sang just a moment ago says. God, we join our song of worship again with a song of worship that is happening around the throne. But God, thank you that we can even look to the world around us and see. God, the, the beauty, the glory that you've created in this world, it even gives you praise. God, thank you for, um, God, just who you are, that you're King of kings, you're Lord of lords. God, thank you that you are the Savior of our lives. God, we thank you for what you've done, God, in our lives. God, that in Romans 5.8 it says, God, that you stood in our place. God, God, that you took our sin upon you. God, that you willingly died in our place for us. Thank you, Lord, for who you are. You are holy. You are awesome. There is no one like you. And so we bring praise to you today. And God, I ask that as we come now to open your word, God, speak to us today from your word. God, I know that I personally, and I pray that this is the prayer of every person in this room. God, we've gathered here today because we want to be made more like Jesus. So today, through the transformative power of your Holy Spirit, through the power of your word, change us today and make us more like our Savior, Jesus. And we ask these things in his name and all of God's people said, amen. God bless you, church. Be seated.
so let's start this Sunday morning with um, something that hopefully joins us together with churches of every denomination and every background. Um, today is a Sanctity of Human Life Sunday, um, simply meaning that today across our nation and around the world, people are pausing to remember um, that we are created in God's image and that every life matters. Each is, you know, formed in the mother's womb by God. Um, he is the author and creator. He is the sustainer of life. He gives us breath. And because of that, we stand with his creation. Uh, we are it. And so it matters. And so today, I just want to pause once more in prayer and for us to join together and ask that God would um, speak over our nation and that all, us as a collective body of believers would support um, the supporting of human life. Would you join me in prayer? Father God, we want to start with repentance. Lord, we have treated your creation so foolishly as though we control it and not you. You're the creator. You're the maker. We are not. Lord, we want to be your servants. And so God, we join together and Lord, we just celebrate life today. God, we are created in your image and yet, God, we have chosen the image of brokenness instead. And so, God, we repent. Lord, would you be with our nation, with our national leaders, Lord, with judges and lawyers and people. God, would you remind us that every life matters to you? God, I'm thinking of that woman today that's struggling with that thought of, what will she do with a baby? And God, I pray that you would intersect her life with somebody that would show her how precious life is. And God, that you would more than just have conversation would show her a way of support beyond that. God, that there would be people like this church that would stand beside a woman and help her and guide her with that baby moving forward. That this would be a place, Lord, that your church, regardless if it's down the street or at Quell Creek, Lord, that we would be a place that wouldn't cast judgment and ridicule, but instead would be a safe haven for a woman who needs help. God, would you make us that? Lord, we join with others today and we just declare that we are your creation. And Lord, that lives matter to you. So God, thank you that we can join together like that. In the name of Jesus, we pray. Amen. Before we get to our text, if you want to begin opening your Bible, um, our focal text is going to be in Ezra chapter 9 today, but we'll get to some other texts before that. But if you found that, and don't forget, you can find that by going right down the middle of your Bible into Psalms or Proverbs, however it falls, and go backwards uh, towards the front, and you will run into Ezra. Or in the front of your Bible, there's an index. Don't ever be afraid to use your Bible as a tool like that, go to the front, look up the page. If anybody in this church goes, oh, you don't know where Ezra is? Send them to Del Moreland. He will beat them up. <laughs> that a baby. That needs healing up. He's ready for a fight, y'all. Um, so anyways, please take your time and find your way to Ezra today, um, either on your phone or in the Bible in front of you or the Bible you brought with you. We want to be together. I'm reminded today of something that happened in the 90s, 91 to 94, the Cleveland Browns took a gamble. They went and found a coach who really hadn't made success yet, but he was a good name. That coach reached out and he found his best friend and he brought him to the team as well. 91 to 94 saw two of the best coaches of all time on the same sideline when Bill Belichick was hired as coach and he hired Nick Saban as his assistant football coach. They're the winningest coaches in NFL and college football history. And they were on the sideline of the 91 to 94 Cleveland Browns. And they were awful. The Cleveland Browns had so much promising, had good players, had the greatest coaches, and they were terrible. You know, a lot of times we have such high expectations of moments. 
And that would have been it, right? If you could look back now, you'd have gone, how did they fail? How did they not win every Super Bowl with those two coaches at the helm? With that great talent they had, with all the draft picks the Cleveland Browns had at the time, so much promise, but yet so much failure. Which leads us to our text. If you remember in Ezra, we were reading that first that God inspired the kings of Persia to start sending back remnants of people back to Jerusalem. First, it was to build the temple. Um, so he sends Zerubbabel, and Zerubbabel and his, uh, the people, the 50,000 that first went, um, they set up a, uh, an altar to God, which was a great start. And remember, they poured the foundation of the temple, and some were celebrating and some were mourning. Those that mourned was because it wasn't Solomon's temple, so they were so crushed. And yet so many were like, but there's a temple being built in Jerusalem. Let's celebrate God. And then, as they were about to start building the temple, all of a sudden opposition began to pour out from within, from without. And they started and they stopped, and this happened time and time again. But they finished the temple. 515 BC, it's done. The temple's dedicated. They have a Passover celebration in remembrance. It is powerful. Every, everything seemed like it was just amazing. And so King Artaxerxes, led by the Spirit of God, which, by the way, as we read about King Artaxerxes in Scripture, you need to know that this would have been Esther's stepson. So if you wanted to weave Scripture together, this Esther marries Xerxes, the king, and his son is named Artaxerxes. And he is a main player now in the book of Ezra. So just... See the connective tissue yet of why the book of Esther matters so much? You know, so many people go, well, why is it in the Bible? It's not really God-centric as much as it is people-centric, the people of God. So why is it in Scripture? Because it is so interwoven in Scripture, it can't not be. It's centralized in what we're reading now. So King Artaxerxes of Persia, led by the Spirit of God, now is going to commission Ezra to return to Jerusalem. Ezra will arrive in Jerusalem about 458 BC. This is 57 years after the temple is built. So we read scripture and we just kind of go, oh, it must have happened like boom, 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 boom. But the temple is built and then 57 years happens. And now Ezra is being sent by the Spirit of God is sending out Ezra back to Jerusalem, and here's what's interesting. Many scholars believe that when Ezra arrives in Jerusalem, he's in his late 20s. Huh. Like, listen, I, there's churches that don't want a 20-year-old preacher. How about a prophet? Right? Like, he's a young guy showing up to talk to people that have worked now in the temple for 57 years, he shows up and he's being sent to instruct the people in the way of following after God in the law of Moses. So let's look at a couple of texts before we get to our focal text today. Ezra chapter 7 verse 6 says that he was a scribe skilled in the law of Moses, which the Lord, the God of Israel, had given. I want you to know, Ezra writes this. So he's saying that here's what he's done. He has been trained in the skill of the law of Moses that God had given. Four verses later, four verses later in the scripture in Ezra chapter 7 verse 10. Listen to how Ezra says it now. Now Ezra had determined in his heart to study the law of the Lord. Why does he change it from the law of Moses to the law of the Lord? Because he knows whose it is. The people around him are all focused on Moses. But he showed up to talk to them about the Lord. Not only is he studying the way of the law of the Lord, but what he also says to obey it and to teach it statues and ordinances in Israel. So Ezra makes his whole plan his resume. This is who I've been. This is what I've studied. I've studied the law of Moses. 
that I'm coming to teach the law of the Lord, how to obey it, and how to pass it on. So he, here he is. He's about to go out and he's about to make his way to Jerusalem. Here's the problem. When King Artaxerxes commissions him to go, he also funds him to go. This is the second time we see the children of God when they're going back to Jerusalem. Now they're not only being commissioned to go, but they're being resourced. And what happens is, is Ezra and the people gather those up. They give them to the priest gold and silver and goods. And then what does he do? He instantly calls for a fast. And a fast is simply this, the foregoing of food for the focus of God. That's a fast. And so he tells the people, we're going to fast. And what I want you to do is focus on God and pray that he delivers us safely from here to Jerusalem. Here's why. The route from Persia to Jerusalem was treacherous, full of thieves, full of evil, full of people that just wanted to find people that were traveling and rob them and kill them. And what does Ezra have with the people? Gold and silver. This is not a good deal. In fact, Scripture tells us that Ezra was afraid to ask Artaxerxes for protection. So he, instead, he goes, I happen to know somebody that can protect us. Let's fast and pray. And they do. And God did. He protected them. All the way on their journey that would have taken four months. Any of y'all ever gone on a trip with your family that you have to drive a couple of days? Huh, that's in a car. This is on foot or in wagon on horse with your family for four months. Man, I'm sure that Ezra's like, Lord, I not only need you to protect me from those around me. Lord, deliver me from my mother-in-law. Um, I, that's not in Scripture. That's Corinthians 17.5. Look that one up. Anyways, but they trusted God and God showed up. And so they find themselves in Ezra chapter 9 in Jerusalem. Listen to what it says. It says, After these things have been done, the leaders approached me and said, The people of Israel and the priests and the Levites have not separated themselves from the surrounding peoples who do detectable practices like those of the Canaanites, Hethites, Pezzarites, Jebusites, Ammonites, Moabites, Egyptians, and Amorites. Indeed, the Israelite men have taken some of their daughters as wives for themselves and their sons so that they have, so that the Holy Spirit has become mixed with the surrounding peoples. The leaders and the officials have taken the lead in this unfaithfulness. When I heard this report, I tore my tunic and robe, pulled out some of the hair from my head and my beard and sat down devastated. Can you imagine this for a moment? Ezra shows up, they've made camp, they're kind of hanging out. They know Ezra knows the law of the Lord. Uh, they have practiced it, and it's the law of Moses. And he shows up, and they go, oh, by the way, Ezra, glad you're here. The people have messed up. And Ezra goes, okay, there's a response to this. The response to this is mourning. And so he tears his tunic, and he pulls out his hair and beard, and he sits down devastated let me ask you a question does anywhere in this passage talk about the fact that ezra took a foreign wife no it doesn't it doesn't say that ezra had participated in mixing of these foreign land people and the people of israel so why is he tearing his tunic and pulling out his beard and hair because it's his people and he knows the holiness of the Lord and he knows his people have abandoned it. And he is in mourning because here's the temple. It's been built. What's more is the more we understand about Scripture, the more we understand, remember I said it's interwoven. In the next few moments as we read Scripture, I want you to hear something interesting. Because the timing of this is well, it's, it's different than we thought. 
let's preview where we're going in Scripture. That as we move out of Ezra, we're going to move into Nehemiah. Nehemiah is sent by God's presence back to Jerusalem to do what? Build a wall of protection around Jerusalem. Right? He is to help build the wall. That's how he is instructed to go and do. But Ezra is about to say something very interesting. Now, I want you to know, in both Ezra chapter 9 and Nehemiah chapter 9, both have prayers of national confession before God. Both of those books, chapter 9, both have a prayer of confession before God. And in Ezra, he is about to start this prayer. And I want you to notice what happens when he begins to speak. Remember, young man, verse 4. Everyone who trembled at the words of the God of Israel gathered around me because of the unfaithfulness of the exiles, which I set devastated until the evening offering. At the evening offering, I got up from my time of humiliation with my tunic and robe torn. Then I fell on my knees and spread out my hands to the Lord my God. And I said, my God, I am ashamed and embarrassed to lift my face towards you. My God, because our iniquities are higher than our heads and our guilt is as high as the heavens. Our guilt has been terrible from the days of our fathers until present. Because of our iniquities, we have handed over along with our kings and priests to the surrounding kings and to the sword, captivity, plundering, and open shame, as it is today. But now for a brief moment, grace has come from the Lord our God to preserve a remnant for us and given us Uh, to give us a stake in his holy place. Even in our slavery, God has given us a little relief and light to our eyes. Though we are slaves, our God has not abandoned us in slavery. He has extended grace to us in the presence of the Persian kings, given us relief so we may rebuild the house of our God and repair its ruins to give us a wall in Judah and Jerusalem. Why in the world does Ezra mention a wall. Amazing, right? Now, our God, what can we say in light of this? For we have abandoned the commands you have given us through your servants and the prophets, saying, the land you're entering to possess is an impure land. The surrounding peoples have filled it from the end to the end with their uncleanliness by their impurity and detestable practices. So do not give your daughters to their sons in marriage or take their daughters to your sons Never pursue their welfare or prosperity so you will be strong. Eat the good things of the land and leave it as an inheritance for your sons forever. After all that has happened to us because of our evil deeds and terrible guilt, through you our God have punished us less than our iniquities deserve and have allowed us to survive. Should we break your commands again and intermarry with peoples who commit these detestable practices? Wouldn't you become so angry with us that you would destroy us leaving neither remnant nor survivor, Lord, our God of Israel. You are righteous, for we survive as a remnant today. Here we are before you with our guilt, though no one can stand in the presence because of this. Ezra sees that to appear before God, you should be holy and blameless. The problem is, from the very first word that he hears from the people, that it's not just the normal folk that have intermarried but what does it say that the leaders and the officials and not just that but if you look back it even says that the priests have intermarried who can appear before a holy god ezra offers none of us and can i just tell you today because of our sin None of us should appear before a holy God either. But we'll get to that here in just a minute. Ezra looks around and he sees that they have mixed into their worship the things that aren't of God. So it leaves us with the question, what have we mixed with our worship that isn't of God? Have we allowed anything into our worship that that God has called detestable but we have added in? Have we added anything into our worship that We have just declared as innocent and it's okay, but God says it's detestable to him. And if so, shouldn't we as Ezra do the same thing? Oh God, that you would forgive us. 
that you would forgive us of the things that we have allowed in that we should never have allowed at all. You see, this is how a church becomes a healthy church. We get rid of the detestable things for the sake of holiness. But it comes through sacrifice. It comes through gut-wrenching approach before a holy God to seek His forgiveness, to seek His favor, to seek His word. And when you and I do that, we will find ourselves like Ezra on our knees with arms out declaring, Oh God, that you would spare us. Can I just remind you of something that Ezra says? God didn't have to spare them. He could have said no. He could have wiped the people clean and cleansed his temple. But he left a remnant because of his name and because of his glory. It's amazing to me what happens when you and I begin to imitate the things of God in our life because we desire to look like him. Ephesians chapter 5 says this, Therefore be imitators of God as dearly loved children and walk in love as Christ also loved us and gave himself for us, a sacrificial and fragrant fragrant offering to God. The sexual immorality and any impurity or greed should not even be heard of among you as is proper for saints. Obscene and foolish talking or crude joking are not suitable, but rather giving thanks for no and recognize this. Every sexual, immoral, and impure or greedy person who is an idolater does not have an inheritance in the kingdom of Christ and of God. Let no one deceive you with empty arguments. For God's wrath is coming on the disobedient because of these things. Therefore, do not become their partners. For you once walked in darkness, but now you are in the light of the Lord. Walk as children of the light. For the fruit of light consists of all goodness, righteousness, and truth. Testing what is pleasing to the Lord. Do not participate in the fruitless works of darkness, but instead expose them. For it is shameful even to mention what is done by them, what is in secret. Everything is exposed by the light is made visible. For what makes everything visible is light. Therefore it is said, get up, sleeper. Rise up from the dead and Christ will shine on you. It's exactly what's happening in Ezra's time. He shows up in Jerusalem. The temple's built. He's ready to share the things of the, that God poured out. And he's ready to joyfully share it. The temple's there. They're worshiping God again. They're out of captivity. And he shows up and they're living still in captivity. And they don't even know it. Listen, this is the problem with modern Christianity. Is that we too are living in captivity and we don't know it. We have mixed so much of the world in with so much of God that we can't distinguish between the two. You are not meant to question if you heard God's voice. But we do because we have so many other voices speaking into us. You are not meant to wonder what God's thoughts were. But we do because we don't know the Word of God. You see, oh Christian, we have mixed so much of the world in that we can't definitively tell the difference between Dr. Seuss and Holy God. And so we wander. We wander through a life that we were never meant to wander through. We were meant to live lives in obedience to God because it's fruitful. The things that break God's heart should break ours too. And so when Ezra sees a brokenness, it breaks him like it does God. Like I mentioned in prayer earlier, you and I are created in the image of God. But we have willfully through sin chosen the image of Adam, which is broken and dying. So at best, we can say we bear the image of Adam and Eve. And they were created, not the creator. So we admire the things of human instead of falling in love with the things of God. And so we're not brokenhearted about anything we do. Our sin seems good to us. And other people's sin seems broken when all sin falls short of the glory of God. It's not His plan. But we choose it. You see, instead we should, su- we should pursue a life that obeys the Word of God. Amen. This is what Ezra cries out. He, he tells God in prayer that they have abandoned His plan. 
In fact, verse 6 of Ezra chapter 90 says, My God, I'm, I'm ashamed and embarrassed to lift my face towards you, my God, because our iniquities are higher than our heads and our guilt is as high as the heavens. Ezra saw that sin had piled up upon them. And the only way to make sense of this would be to look at the sacrificial system that was before them. That when you brought sacrifice and as they threw the animals upon this fire, what was left, they would chunk off and there would be piles of bones. And you just imagine how sin would cover a multitude of everything that's happening, but grace covers a multitude of sin. And Ezra is crying out, y'all don't understand You can't keep sinning and asking God to forgive you because this is incompatible with pursuing holiness. You can't just go, well, I sinned today, I'm going to come offer a lamb. I sinned today, I'm going to come offer doves. I sinned today, I'm going to come offer grains. I sinned today, I'm going to... He's like, do you understand that God's plan for you is holiness, not sacrifice? And listen, today, church, as a New Testament church, you got to know this. You can't offer sacrifice to pay for your sins. Jesus did that. And we choose through obedience and faith to have a relationship with a Savior who loved us while we were yet sinners. It says that Christ died for us while we were in that state. And because of that, you and I can pursue Him, but to pursue Him, you got to quit holding on to sin. When I was young and learning to drive, if you can remember back, you didn't quite understand how hard to press the gas pedal or how firm to press the brake. So what happens? You get behind the wheel of your parents there in their calm state and they say, okay, we're going to start slow. Um, Once you put your foot on the brake and let's start the car, good. Let's put it into drive. I want you to take your foot off the brake. We're going to roll. Then I just want you to firmly put your foot back on the brake soft and we're going to stop. How long does that voice last? Oh, it goes quick, doesn't it? As somebody who moved from driver to father, woo! Makes you pray different, doesn't it? Telling your kid, okay, you're doing great. Just lightly on the brake, and you go, huh! Oh, oh. Lightly on the, you don't have to push it like we're, there's nothing in front of you. We're in an empty parking lot, just lightly. Okay, let's start again. Ha! Ha! Whew! Your mom should come teach you to drive. I don't want to do this. I don't, I don't like this. And then the gas pedal. Okay, we're going to lightly push on the gas. Just light. Ha! Right? Hair's flowing back. Break! 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 And, ha! Put it in park. Put it in... Get out. Get out of my car. You're never going to drive. This is the Christian experience. Full of starts and stops and just, ah, ah. God, I want to do better. Ah, ah, ah. And God's like, we're okay. (laughs) This isn't how you're supposed to do this. But now, like, as a dad... To see my kids drive across town, you don't see the starts and stops. They're becoming professional grade. Now you can ride with them and look at your phone at the same time. Early on, you watch them drive like this. Okay, we got this. That's just so the the seatbelt doesn't give you you know that like you know rash or bruising. You're holding on. Now you can relax. This is a Christian experience. You were meant for more than sudden starts and stops. And in Ezra's time, they had gone so great and they had built the temple and they were doing great things and uh, mixed in the, the foreign gods of people around them. And he's like, this is not it. This is not how this was meant to go. And he just reminds them, God had a plan for y'all. He has a plan for you. You can build all the temples you want, but if you avoid his plan, that's a building. Y'all built a building because you forgot the God at the center of it. By the way, in the wilderness, they build the tent 
and the presence of God fills it, just descends upon it, then they build the temple to God, what happens then? Presence of God descends upon it, and then, then all of a sudden Zerubbabel and them come back to rebuild the temple. What happens? Nothing. God's presence never fills it. Do you wonder why? None of the people were going to follow God's ways. So why would he fill a temple if they weren't going to pursue him anyway? It's powerful to me that you and I can pursue a holy God at all. In fact, Scripture tells us that if we seek Him, we will find Him. But how does a holy God allow a broken people to pursue Him at all? It would be like me, as these folks are leading towards the Olympics, saying, I challenge all of y'all to a race. Who's going to come to Amarillo, Texas to race me? None of them. They know that they're so superior in everything that why would they come and race me? See, our God is superior in every way to us. Slow to anger, compassionate and kind, forgiving. In fact, Scripture tells us that He takes our sin and in Christ He removes it away from us as far as the east is from the west. And I've said it before. You can't go far enough west that you've turned east. You're still going west. In this powerful moment, we hear the psalmist in Psalm 24 say this, The earth and everything in it, the world and its inhabitants, belong to the Lord. For he laid its foundation on the seas and established it on rivers. Who may ascend the mountain of the Lord? Who may stand in his holy place, the one who has clean hands and a pure heart, who has not appealed to what is false and who has not sworn deceitfully? He will receive blessing from the Lord and righteousness from God for his salvation. Such is the generation of those who inquire of him, who seek the face of God of Jacob. Then it asked us to pause. Lift up your heads, O you gates. Raise up ancient doors, and the King of glory will come in. And who is the King of glory? The Lord, strong and mighty. The Lord, mighty in battle. Lift up your heads, you gates. Raise Uh, Rise up, ancient doors, and the King of glory will come in. Who is He, the King of glory, the Lord of armies? He is the King of glory. Salah. Today is a good day to seek the cleansing of the Lord. It's a good day for that. Sam loved Aaron for as long as he could remember. When they were in elementary, he loved her, but in middle school, they became an item. Sam and Aaron dated all through middle school and all through high school. And as they were leading towards their senior year, Sam did a brave move. He went to a local jeweler and he bought a promise ring. After graduation, a couple of weeks later, Sam got down on one knee and he proposed to Aaron and he said, I've loved you since I've seen you. Would you marry me? And she said, no, not yet, Sam. Heartbroken, he kept the ring and The two of them went to the local university that was close to them. Eventually, they were leading towards graduation. Each year, Sam would get down on one knee, say, Aaron, I've loved you as long as I've known you. Would you marry me? And each year, she said no. They graduated from college, and a few years into adulthood, and a couple of more rejections, Sam had enough. And he went to a pawn store, and he pawned off the ring. He was angry. Two years after the pawning of the ring, Sam was done. He booked a table at their favorite restaurant. And he asked Aaron to meet him. And across from the table, Aaron could see that Sam was not his normal self. What's wrong, Sam? Aaron asked. He said, I'm over it. I'm tired. I'm done. All these years of asking and all these years of being rejected. I can't have the one girl that I've always wanted in my life. And so Aaron, I'm, and before he could say the word, she said, yes. Yes, Sam, I'll marry you. They've been married 50 years today. You see, all of our lives are full of the question, what will you do with Jesus? 
And for so many people in this room, we have time and time and time again said no to Christ. He has been faithful. He has been waiting. And yet we've said no. Today is a good day a good day to look across the table at the Savior and say yes. It's a good day for that. It's a good day to repent like Ezra and say, I have messed up and I have fallen short of what you wanted me to be, but God, before you, I confess my sin and ask you to forgive me because of what Jesus did on the cross on my behalf. Lord, I declare that you can forgive my sin and lead my life. He'll do that today. Faith and belief, confession, those are the steps to know Christ. And today, you should know Him. Today, you should say yes to Jesus. Let me pray for you. Heavenly Father, I pray for my friends in this room who for too long have rejected you as the Savior of their life. But today, God, I pray that they would understand that their sin has taken them further than you've ever wanted them to go. And that the plan you have for their life is so much better than what they're living. And God, we just declare today before you our need for you. And we're so thankful, Lord, for what you did on the cross for us. We plead and beg and ask that today you would rob us of our sin, cleanse our minds and our hearts. And Lord, today that you would lead us away from sin and towards you. Lord, we all need that in our life, and so no one's immune from that question. What will we do with Jesus? And Lord, I pray that everybody in this room today will have said yes to him before they've left this room. So Lord, would you speak? Lord, would you make us obedient to listen and respond? Lord, we pray this in the name of Jesus, the name above all names. In your name we pray, amen. Would you stand with me? I and some friends will be down here to meet with you. We'd love to talk to you about Jesus today. Would you come as we worship him?
touches how good, how holy, how awesome you are. You are truly set apart, God. There is no one like you. So Lord, as we've just sung those words, God, open our eyes in wonder, God, to see all that is around us that you've created. God, show us who you are. Make us more like you and fill us with your heart to lead in your love to those around us. God, what a prayer. Show us who you are this week. God, as we go to scatter from this place, God, in our personal lives this week, show us more of who you are, Jesus. We want to know you more intimately, more deeply than we ever have before. Fill us with your heart. Fill us with the compassion and the love of Jesus. God, may that pour out of us. Lead us each day. God, each day, may we walk in surrender to you. Lead us in your love to those around us. God, all around us in our, in our homes, in our workplaces, in the businesses that we frequent week in and week out, there are people who need to know of the love of Jesus. So, Lord, may we be bold enough in our faith, Lord Jesus, to speak of who you are, of what you've done in our lives, God, if we were to take a microphone and pass it around this room today, Lord, we would be here for many, many hours recounting your faithfulness to us. So Lord, help us to walk in that love that we have experienced and to show that love to others around us as we leave from this place today. Lord, I pray your blessing on these, my friends, that are here today, on those that are watching online. God, I pray that they've been encouraged today, but Lord, more than being encouraged. God, may we walk out of this room differently and go make a difference in the world around us for the gospel of Jesus Christ. And we ask these things today in your name, Lord. Amen. God bless you, church. Have a wonderful week. You're dismissed.